Is a geothermal greenhouse actually worth the effort? It works in theory, but in today's video, I'm reviewing with you all of the data I've collected through the month of December. While the temperatures outside are in the 30s or below for the month, look at this top light blue area. Temperatures in the 80s many days inside the dome. I'm going to break it down for you exactly how the system performed over our first month of winter. If you're new here, we built our greenhouse dome in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado at over 9,300 feet. That puts us in zone 4B, where we can see significant temperature fluctuations, high winds, and heavy snow loads. But we know the abundant sun in Colorado would provide a significant advantage, allowing us the benefit from the raw power of the intense sun. We built a climate battery or a ground air heat transfer system four feet under our dome to capture the daytime solar heat and bank it in tubes underground, keeping the large ground mass warmer as well as the dome warmer overall as the heat passively radiates back up into the dome. A climate battery may not technically be geothermal energy per se, it is a way to passively heat the dome using heat stored underground. In December, I have the system fan set to run automatically at 70 degrees, which can often kick on as early as 11 a.m. if it's sunny, and the air will start circulating through the entire series of tubing until the dome cools down later in the day, usually at about 3.30 or 4 p.m. when we lose the sunshine over the mountain. But the climate battery isn't the only system helping to regulate the temperature in the dome. We also have a 3,000 gallon pond, which keeps a much steadier temperature from day to night. I've noticed that it tends to give up one or two degrees overnight and is able to recoup that on the following day as long as it's sunny out because the sun's radiation warms the pond back up. That's why it's painted black. Some days I've seen it gain over three degrees in a single day, and some days it doesn't increase much at all if it's really cold and overcast. I've seen the pond get as low as the upper 40s, down to 47.7, and peak at 60 degrees in December. The water to fill the tank is somewhere around 53 degrees, but I should probably recheck that. That's water that's coming in through an underground well. Although the pond is not geothermal, it is a significant thermal mass that keeps the dome warmer in the winter and opposite cooler in the summer by absorbing the heat and cooling the dome with evaporation. Exactly how effective are these two systems keeping the dome warm during winter? First, let's look at the air temperatures outside. We've had a warmer than average December in our area. Many days outside have been above freezing. Well, the first week of December was well below freezing outside, but the dome reached temperatures of 70 and 80 degrees on sunny days. But on overcast days, it didn't get over 50 degrees. If you're wondering what this huge gap is, that was when we lost power for two days. It showed the dome stuck at 42 degrees, which was where it was at at midnight when the power went out. Weather station also tracks wind data, which you can see it was a very windy December. In in addition to temperature, I'm also tracking humidity in the dome, and as you can see, it's quite high in the winter time. This is due to a combination of factors, including the respiration of vegetation, having the pond, and not opening the vents due to cold weather outside. The humidity is highest at night and lowest when it's the sunniest and warmest in the dome. I think going forward, it makes sense to add a dehumidifier to use in the winter months to reduce potential problems associated with high humidity, like mold, rot, and other problems with pests. In the warm months, excess humidity is not really a problem. Going back to temperature, the coldest it's been in the dome was down to 37.8 degrees. This was at 9 p.m. after several overcast days in a row, and I was nervous to see it drop any lower. So I turned on the system fan for the climate battery. You can see where there's a slight bump up in temperature until about midnight, and then it gradually starts to drop down a few more degrees, but it maintains the dome above freezing. And I'm learning to turn on the underground air fan to circulate air when the dome temperature is at 40 degrees or less at 9 p.m. Now we do have one insurance policy and that is supplemental heat in the form of a small space heater, which we've only used a handful of times last month because as much faith as I have in the air transfer system, I'm still learning how good it is and I don't wanna lose it all if I can use a piece of insurance. A space heater is an expensive option for heat if you're gonna use that to heat up a greenhouse all winter, but for here and there, for us, it seems to be working fine. Now we're still considering alternatives to heating such as a rocket mass stove or a wood stove, especially for 
we're going to face a different type of winter with much colder temperatures. Overall, this is a typical day temperature fluctuation in the dome. It's a wide swing, but it has stayed above 37 degrees at night all month long. The dome is officially off-grid and powered by a solar array built earlier in the year. We have an inverter charge controller inside which converts solar into energy stored into the two batteries. This is currently powering the climate battery fan and the water pump in the pond and other fans, but is not quite enough to run a space heater all night long, although we haven't tried that yet. Probably could get a few hours though. It's easy to charge the batteries up to 100% on a single sunny day, and this is more than enough to run the fans. But I'm thinking additionally, we could use the energy for lighting, like grow lights, and additional circulation fans to help with airflow. So is it worth the effort to install geothermal heat or underground air heat transfer systems? We ended up spending an extra $10,000 in concrete expenses, excavation, tubing. All of that's a considerable expense to account for. But what it's given us in return is a greenhouse that needs hardly any intervention to keep from freezing in the winter. So far, we always need to remind everyone that this is our very first winter with the dome and it's 100% a learning experience, learning how to optimize and work with what we've got. For us, what is it worth to have a green oasis to run to when it's snowing outside, to be able to grow our own food year round and live where we wanna live in the mountains? It's having the best of both worlds, and I'm pretty sure the best is yet to come. So if you find this interesting, definitely follow along to see what and how we can grow more food in our dome. Spring planting is happening soon, and let us know in the comments what we should try to grow next.